video three. We're going to talk about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Why am I going out of order? Because I can, and because I feel like we need to understand the climate that Jesus came into. In the next video, I'm planning on talking about the very first thing that happened with Jesus when he began his ministry, but let's talk about the climate at the time. So there's two governing groups among the Jews. There's the Sadducees who are extremely wealthy and the Pharisees. The Sadducees controlled this, the Jewish temple. They controlled the Sanhedrin. They, um, they were the governing body for both religious and legal issues, and they lived by the laws found in the Old Testament. So there is about 600 laws in the Old Testament. The Sadducees reject anything um, supernatural. They don't believe in heaven, they don't believe in hell, and they lived that way. So everything essentially was about wealth and money and power. Because if you think about it, if there's nothing beyond this, you know, why would you love other people? Why would you take care of other people? This is your one life to live. Like, do it for yourself. That's basically what they did. So they uh, they followed the 600 laws of Moses and yeah, everything was about money. Often in the New Testament, the Sadducees are called wicked, adul adulterous, a brood of vipers. And they also, in the New Testament, they frequently arrest the apostles. And, um, you know, anyway, just not a fan of Jesus. So they saw Jesus as a threat because they were, he was challenging the belief system. Okay. He's disrupting the belief system. The Sadducees have it pretty well off because in the community, they're up here. And so of course you don't want somebody coming in and saying, God loves the poor. God wants us to focus on the poor and those who need us. The Sadducees were not a fan of that. So something very, uh, there's a moment, I'm going to read it to you in Matthew 21. It's when Jesus turns over the te the tables in the temple. So it says, and Jesus entered into the precinct of the temple of God and cast out all who were selling and buying in the temple precincts and overturned the table of the money changers and those who were selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you make it a robber's cave. And then from there it says, and then the blind and lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Okay, so what's the big deal? There's some people outside the temple selling selling things to be sacrificed. This is what, uh, what you had to do to be forgiven for your sins. If you sinned, you had to bring a sacrifice and you know, put your sins on that sacrifice. Well, here's where the exploitation comes in. People who, again, were poor would bring whatever they had. So they often couldn't afford a live animal. So they would bring things, bread, wheat, fruit, something like that as a sacrifice. They would arrive to the temple with their sacrifice, hoping to be forgiven of their sins. And the Sadducees would be like, no, sorry, that sacrifice isn't enough. Buy one of the things I'm selling. So they would sell these poor people things that were, the prices were so marked up that, you know, they were being exploited. And Jesus was like, absolutely not, okay? So the, you know, the Sadducees were just making money off these animal sacrifices and it was actually a practice that was established by, I think his name is Ananias, the high priest. He was a Sadducee. So the, let's talk about the Pharisees now. So the Pharisees are the most influential religious and political group in the New Testament. They, they don't hang out with common people because common people are unclean. And um, they put a huge emphasis on oral tradition and the laws. So again, the 600 laws of Moses, in addition to the 10 commandments. Jesus confronts them though, because they're placing, following these laws on everyday people, poor people, but they show no concern for those who really truly need help. They pray in public, they make a big show of, you know, their fasting and their prayer lives, but they don't, as Jesus calls them out, you do not practice what you preach. You do not care. God cares about these small people. God cares about the people who are being abused. You guys don't. And this begins to, again, disrupt the Pharisees' way of life. And this is why the Pharisees and the Sadducees wanted to kill him, because he was no longer making their life easy. For example, so in Mark 12, we get a story about a poor widow. This woman comes into the temple, something also, which is interesting. The temple was um, divided up so that the wealthy would be in one area and then like the common people would be in another. They would keep them separated because, I mean, you know, if you're going to church and you're like wealthy, you don't want to have to sit with like regular people. That's gross. So 
the wealthy people sat in one place and they actually had a little bridge that would take them into the temple so they didn't even have to walk by poor people. It's like, okay. But this poor woman, this poor widow was in temple. At that time, if a woman became a widow, she essentially had like no options, I guess. Maybe three. If someone would remarry her, she could do that. She could become a prostitute to earn money or she could beg, okay? We don't know which one this woman's doing. But this poor woman gives a coin in the collection basket that doesn't even equal like a cent, but it was absolutely everything she had. Jesus points her out. He points her out for being willing to fully sacrifice everything she had, you know, for God. But that's not the entire point of the story. The other point of the story is that the Pharisees put these this overbearing laws over these people saying you have to give you have to give that meanwhile were they donating money sure but it didn't touch the you know the giant substantial amount of their income they might be putting in you know a hundred dollars but when you have hundreds of thousands of dollars does it really make that big of a difference no so jesus is pointing out how these restrictions are being put on people who you know honestly should be being taken care of now, at this time, it was really believed that if you, you know, if a woman couldn't have children, if a baby was born with a birth defect, if someone's husband or wife died, if someone was blind or sick, it was believed at this time because of the book of like Deuteronomy and other books in the Pentateuch that God was punishing people. Okay. So the Sorry, I'm blanking on my words. Anyway, but God punished people. That's what they believed. So in the first five books of the Bible, it was seen that God was punishing people. If something bad happened in your life, it's because you brought it on yourself with sin. Now, this is going to help make sense why the Pharisees and the Sadducees were so upset when Jesus began to heal people. In Mark 3, for example, there's a man with a withered hand. And it's the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day, you cannot do any work, okay? You are, you are to rest. There's a man with a hand that essentially doesn't function, and Jesus heals him. He performs an actual miracle and heals him. But it causes an uproar because is Jesus doing the work of the devil? That's what, I mean, that's what we read in Scripture. They're questioning, is Jesus doing the work of the devil? Because they believed God punished that man or punish that man's parents for being sinners by giving him a withered hand. In another one, when Jesus is teaching in the synagogue in Luke 13, he heals a woman with scoliosis. And it's on the Sabbath. Both times, people are like, oh my gosh, he is undoing the work of God by healing these sinners. So it's like, holy cow. Okay, what's going on here? So in Deuteronomy, in the first five books of the Bible, they talk about um, curses. So if a child is born blind, it's because the parents sin. However, when we read scripture, um, I really like, like in John chapter nine, Jesus explains this. There's a man born blind that Jesus heals. And we hear the apostles ask him after this miracle is performed, what happened? What did that man do to deserve God making him blind to begin with? And Jesus says he didn't do anything. It just happened. Okay. It was able to be used for the glory of God, but he didn't do anything. These things just occur. So when we start to look at, okay, well, if scripture's talking about um, curses or sin cycles or things like that, what, what exactly is that? This is what that means. Uh, to give an example, imagine that there's a, a man who he's an alcoholic, he abuses his children. Most likely, those children who grow up in an abusive environment will grow up to be abusers as well. This is what we look at as kind of like a cycle, or as they would say, a curse. It's not that God was like, I curse you, you know, your life is going to be terrible and miserable. But by our own choices, by our own free will, we often carry on these very unhealthy things generationally. And it takes a very strong person to finally say, no longer, this is not continuing with me. So that's what we, we understand. But when it comes to God, God doesn't punish you on earth by giving you a disability or you know if you can't have if there's a woman we know that one in eight women struggle with fertility if you end up not being able to have a child it is not because god is punishing you it is something biological 
hurricanes happen, okay? Earthquakes happen, tornadoes happen. It's actually, there's a tornado warning today or a watch. So it was kind of a sleepless night last night. But um, yeah, this is not, this is not something that God is doing to you. So one of the final notes to make on this is Jesus is basically presenting a new type of God to us. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are not in favor of this type of God. When Jesus is asked, how are we to pray? We're given the Our Father. Think of those, those first two words though. Jesus, how are we supposed to pray? Well, you say Our Father. First off, that Our means we're all connected to each other. Every single one of us is connected. That's kind of big, right? To say, you, Pharisee, are connected to me. You, widow, are connected to me. The wealthy is connected to me. The poor are connected to me. We are all joined as one and we share one father. So our father. This is, you know, completely changing the way things are seen at this time. That's amazingly pivotal, okay? Your video response. What I want you to write about is how do you understand sin, suffering, and, you know, pretty much anything bad that can happen? Where do you see God's role in earthquakes, tornadoes, people that are very sick and dying, people who are widowed, people who can't have children? How do you see God's role in that? Because something huge that we need to undo if it's in you at all is the understanding that God does not do these things to people. God is not a puppet master who is controlling every move just to see if you can handle it. And later, I'm actually going to talk about the book of Job because the book of Job is, in my mind, one of the most overly abused books where it makes it seem like God is bored and does crap to us just to see if we can handle it. But please write about how you understand suffering. And then also I want you to write about how you understand sin and how it affects other people. So take time on this, you know, write a decent amount, really get your thoughts out because this is something I'm hoping that we get to have a really good conversation about when you turn your journals in. So anyway, that's the Pharisees, that's the Sadducees. That's the understanding of what Jesus was doing when he was working miracles. I hope you enjoyed this video. In the next one, we're going to talk about Jesus in the desert and we're going to talk about his baptism. So until next time.